Hello and welcome. We're delighted to have such an excellent turnout for today's important conversation. And thank you very much to our audience for taking time to attend. We're very glad you're here. And I would like to invite participants to please introduce yourselves in the meeting chat. My name is Lawrence Alexander, and I'm chair of the Board for International Food and Agricultural Development, or BIFAD. And also, I'm chancellor of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. I'm honored and privileged to serve for the last decade in a key leadership role at one of our nation's premier 1890 public land grant HBCUs. The topic for today's meeting is near and dear to my heart, not only because I lead a historically Black university, but because I've been very involved in issues around minority serving institution engagement for many years. I'd also like to invite fellow BIFAD members to introduce themselves briefly, starting with Henri Moore. Henri. Hello everyone, my name is Henri Moore and I am the Vice President and Head of Responsible Business at Haleon Corporation. Thanks. Thank you, Henri. Next, we have Pamela Anderson. Hello, everyone. I am Pamela Anderson. I'm the Director General Emerita of the CGIAR's International Potato Center, and I've had the privilege of serving on BIFAD since 2015. Very happy to be at this meeting today. Thank you, Pamela. Next, we have Marie Boyd. Hello, everyone. My name is Marie Boyd. I'm an associate professor of law at the University of South Carolina, and my research focuses on food law and policy and administrative law. Really happy to be here. Thank you, Marie. Next, we have Ratan Lal. Good afternoon. This is Ratan Lal. I'm professor of soil science at the Ohio State University and director of the Lal Carbon Center. My objective is to promote adoption of technology that improves soil health and increase productivity and nutritional quality of the food globally. Thank you. Thanks, Ratan. Next, we have Sawida Liverpool tassi um, Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. I'm Sawida Liverpool tassi I'm a Michigan State University Foundation Professor in the Department of Agricultural, Food and Resource Economics. And my interest is on food systems transformation in Sub-Saharan Africa and its implication for the welfare of smallholder farm, um, farmers and their families. Thank you, it's good to be here. Thank you, Sawida. Our final BIFED member, Kathy Spann, is president and CEO of Helen Keller International. And she regrets that she will not be able to join us today. For those of you not familiar with BIFAD, we advise the administrator of USAID directly and work to ensure that USAID brings the assets of U.S. universities to bear on development challenges in agriculture and food security and supports their representation in USAID programming. When we met with USAID Administrator Samantha Power last year to discuss her priorities and what advice would be most useful to her, she responded that the agency is positioned to make progress in diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and she welcomed BIFAD's input on MSI engagement, especially around how MSIs can contribute to research and the future international development workforce. So, responding to her request and the agency's priority to promote and sustain inclusive and equitable engagement of diverse voices to support the U.S. Glo government global food security strategy, BIFED plans to propose the establishment of a high visibility standing committee on minority serving institutions, MSI, engagement and leadership in USAID's agriculture, food security, and nutrition policies and programming next year. Today's event is an opportunity to share these plans with the public and to hear from our community of stakeholders. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. The meeting recording and all questions and comments will be shared publicly. A draft terms of reference for the proposed subcommittee, including preliminary objectives 
and a membership plan is now available for review. We'll discuss these later in today's program. And welcome your feedback, both today and over the next two weeks. You can find the draft terms of reference document posted to usa.gov slash BIFAD and linked in today's event materials. And we'll also share the link in the chat. The public comment period will close on July 12th. In the coming months, BIFAD will work to finalize the terms of reference and to identify subcommittee candidates in line with the draft membership plan. Once USAID's administrator has approved the terms of reference, we expect to launch this, the subcommittee and appoint members this fall to support it in developing its initial work plan and to begin sharing its priority efforts early next year. This afternoon, we are honored to hear from a truly remarkable group of experts and thought leaders who are already immersed in this important work. I look forward to each of their reflections on how the board can build upon their experiences and established processes to tackle this work efficiently, effectively, and with everyone in today's virtual room collaboratively. First, we are so pleased to hear from USA Councilor Clinton White and Dina Esposito, Assistant to the Administrator, Feed the Future Deputy Coordinator for Development and Agency Global Food Crisis Coordinator and USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. Councillor White, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chancellor Alexander. And thank you for that kind introduction and to you and the BIFIT for convening this meeting on efforts to deepen our engagement with minority serving institutions and a warm welcome to our MSI partners joining us today. Good afternoon, good evening, even maybe some good morning to people. And thank you all for joining us here today. We are really thrilled to have this incredible wealth of knowledge and, ex and expertise that BIFAD represents. We look to the advisory board to convene thought leaders from across US universities and other groups to help guide our strategy and building a more food secure world. There has never been a more important time for USAID to turn to global experts in agriculture and nutrition as we grapple with unprecedented shocks to our food systems. An estimated 205 million people are in dire need of life-saving food assistance and some 768 million are facing chronic hunger. That's why it is invaluable that we draw on the latest evidence provided by BIFAD to inform our programs and strategy particularly in the U.S. government's global food security strategy, which guides our whole of government, government be the future initiative. Dina will speak to those aspects in a few minutes. But our work can only reach its full potential when we tap into the full diversity of the United States. Our university partners help us tackle today's biggest challenges and are already on the forefront of developing the game-changing solutions we need for a better future. Today's timely meeting is a vital step to forward and taking action and strengthening USAID's engagement of MSIs in our development agenda. I want to provide you with an example of how USAID is addressing food security and strengthening economic development in Nepal. Two weeks ago, I was in Nepal to launch a 5 million US agriculture higher education activity. That USAID award was provided to Tuskegee University in collaboration with Nepali partner Satguru to enhance the capacity of the agriculture and forestry university and increase the number of workforce ready students by strengthening the university's research and teaching methodology. Through this new partnership, AFU will be able to leverage Tuskegee University's experience to strengthen the academic research and extension capacity of AFU and develop the entrepreneurial spirit of AFU students to become a significant force in the agricultural transformation of Nepal, which also has a women's empowerment component around agriculture. Again, this is showing how USAID is at the forefront of working with our MSI partners on food security and ensuring that there's economic growth um, along the way as well. Also through our MSI partnership initiative, 
our partnerships with some of you here today align with our bureau and offices within the agency, as well as our missions and ways for students, faculty, and researchers to collaborate to develop new and better ways to help us tackle today's pressing global challenges. USAID has many partnerships with MSIs today, including six MOUs through the MSI Partnership Initiative. I also want to take a moment to highlight a few of these promising partnerships through our Bureau of Resilience and Food Security. This past April, as part of our MOU signed with Delaware State University, I participated in our co-hosting a Global Resilience Day on campus to promote awareness and action towards building resilience in the face of global challenges such as climate change and food security. Moreover, we're also celebrating the university's first graduates of the Thomas Wyatt Turner Fellowship Program, where USAID funded this fellowship named in honor of the first Black American to earn a doctorate from Cornell University as part of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Crop Improvements MSI Fellowship Associate Award with additional support from Cornell University. The fellowship supports students at Delaware State University and other 1890s MSIs who earn advanced degrees to become the next generation of leaders in inclusive and sustainable agriculture development. I also wanted to point out that Texas State University, or Texas State, the University of Arkansas at Pine Buff Bluff University, North Carolina A&T, Alabama A&M, and the University of Puerto Rico all received awards under USAID's long-term assistance and services for research partners for university-led solutions engine, our Laser Pulse, a program that delivers research-driven solutions for USAID's partner countries. Additionally, through what we're calling Partnership Incubator Awards, USAID has been providing tailored technical assistance to MSIs, including coaching on how to successfully compete for and implement USAID awards in the areas of financial management, strategic planning, communications, business development, and monitoring evaluation and learning. For MSIs, the University of Texas, San Antonio, Florida International University, University of Hawaii at Mano and Langston University have been awarded these grants. I also wanna point out that we have Dana Alzuma, who is our MSI coordinator at USAID, and she can also provide you answers to your questions when it comes to working with USAID. While, currently, while USAID currently lacks the congressional set-asides for MSIs that other federal agencies have, we are able to restrict eligibility to MSIs when there is programmatic rationale for doing so to help expand and diversify the agency's partner base. Our recently released acquisition and assistance strategy included language emphasizing this. So again, today's meeting is an opportunity for us to be self-reflective and to hear from the community about what USAID is doing right and what we can be doing better to be more inclusive. And at this point, I'd like to hand it over to now to one person whom I truly admire in this agency for how she's not only changing the way that we do business, but also helping us lead on food security. Dina Esposito, thank you. As Councillor White noted, we are actually at an acute moment uh, in terms of global food security, where poverty, food security, and nutrition trends are actually all moving in the wrong direction and reversing decades of progress in the fight against global hunger. I am really pleased at this moment in time to be leading USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security and serving as the Deputy Coordinator for Feed the Future, which is the U.S. government's global flagship hunger and food security initiative. Perhaps you saw that Feed the Future logo alongside USAID on the uh, original slide. Administrator Power is designated by the President of the United States to serve as the overall coordinator of Feed the Future, and our Bureau leads um, in driving a lot, of, a lot of this work. Its primary focus is to work hand-in-hand -hand with partner countries to develop their agricultural sectors and to break the vicious cycle of poverty and hunger. During the first decade of Feed the Future, extreme poverty, hunger, and child stunting all declined by 20 to 25 percent in areas where the initiative worked, while children's diets and women's empowerment both improved. Many of Feed the Future's long-term investments designed to boost agricultural productivity 
are proving critical right now from improved seeds that allow farmers to grow more climate resilient and pest resistant crops to private sector partnerships that create new markets and demand for both those improved seeds and the resulting harvests. But we know that the size and scale of the current food crisis and continuing shocks means that there's much more work to be done. We have both an urgent need and an opportunity right now to accelerate changes that can transform our food system. But achieving that transformational change does require us to work differently. We need to include those who have been historically marginalized. We need innovative ideas and new perspectives. We need evidence-based research, which is one of the most effective investments we can make to reduce global poverty, hunger, and malnutrition. And we need strategic partnerships to help expand our reach and impact. Fortunately, we have great resources at hand to do this, America's higher education community. And within this community, we are particularly grateful for the minority serving institutions, which are uniquely well positioned to partner with USAID. Councillor White referred to some of the ways we're engaging with MSIs and other higher education institutions. Over the past nine months, the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security has connected with over 5,000 students and alumni and 1,000 university faculty and administrative staff from more than 109 colleges and universities, including at MSIs and with underrepresented groups. We did this through our partnership with Minorities in Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Related Sciences, or MANNERS, a national network that supports professional advancement of underrepresented groups. You're going to be hearing more later in the program from a representative of MANNERS. We've also been very excited to partner with MSIs on research. Our flag, flagship Feed the Future Innovation Labs draw upon the expertise of top U.S. universities and developing country research institutions to tackle some of the world's greatest challenges in agriculture and food security. Currently, there are 20 Feed the Future Innovation Labs led by 13 land-grant universities. Those innovation lab partners in turn partner with 71 other U.S. colleges and universities, 24 of which are MSIs, including nine historically Black colleges and universities and 11 Hispanic-serving institutions. A great example of the ripple effect of these partnerships is the Food Safety Innovation Lab led jointly by Purdue and Cornell, which has created a model for how to better engage and support MSIs in the process of applying for USAID for subawards, ensuring the design and outreach consider the barriers to success many MSIs face and reduce administrative burdens. We could not be as successful in our work without the considerable expertise of MSIs in the agriculture sector and in applied research, particularly in areas related to natural resource management and extension that are readily, readily transferable to developing country contexts. You are all attending this meeting, so it is likely you are well aware of the many benefits MSIs bring, but it bears repeating. The faculty and students at MSIs have extensive experience with communities across our nation with ethnic, linguistic, and cultural diversity, and they are often abundantly familiar with the challenges and needs of smallholder farmers and producers that we work with around the world. We found these to be critical skills in fostering strong collaborations in our partner countries. MSIs have profound passion and vision that propels them in their work, both in efforts abroad and with indigenous and underrepresented communities across the United States. This combination of unique skills, perspectives, and knowledge is an invaluable asset to USAID, and we are already reaping the benefits. Together, we are working to advance cutting edge solutions that will drive real progress for global food security and nutrition, but there is always more we can do. USAID is very enthusiastic about BIFAD's proposal to establish a subcommittee on minority serving institution engagement and leadership, and I want to thank BIFAD again for launching this effort and for hosting this important listening session. I look forward to the key lessons and learning that emerge from it and to our continued collaboration with BIFAD and to our expanding partnerships with MSIs on our global agriculture, food security, and nutrition agendas. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you, Councillor White, and thank you, Dina, for those reflections on the work of USAID that you're already doing to strengthen relationships with MSIs 
and its commitment to both broadening and deepening such investments. Now it's my pleasure to welcome BIFAD member Henri Moore. Henri will share the draft objectives and membership plans for the proposed subcommittee. Thanks, Lawrence. It's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon and to share BIFAD's vision to accelerate MSI engagement and leadership in USAID's agricultural, food security, and nutrition policies, as well as programming. Our work builds on previous recommendations in 2010 by an ad hoc MSI working group led by the late Dr. William DeLauder, BIFAT member and president emeritus of Dell State University. I would like to recognize Dr. DeLauder's work as an important foundation for our continued efforts. As we considered next steps, BIFAT felt that a permanent or standing subcommittee offers several advantages over an ad hoc or fixed term modality to address MSI engagement. The permanent structure is informed by past efforts that have demonstrated the need for consistent tracking of progress over time, which we'll hear more about later in today's program. Rather than committing to a fixed work plan for the duration of its efforts, a standing subcommittee can reassess the best use of its attention and resources at regular intervals with input from the community of MSI stakeholders to advance its long-term goals. As outlined in the draft terms of reference, the proposed subcommittee has four overarching objectives, which I think we're going to great. <laughs> The first is to inform recommendations to strengthen, to strengthen partnerships with MSIs as thought leaders in implementing partners in global agriculture-led growth, resilience, food security, and nutrition. The subcommittee's work will inform recommendations to strengthen partnerships among MSIs, USAID, and the other USAID implementing partners in collaborative efforts to advance the U.S. government's global food security strategy. The subcommittee will support an agency goal to promote and sustain the inclusive and equitable engagement of MSIs and agency policy and programming relevant to the strategy. Recommendations will, clarify, will clearly identify opportunities to address specific gaps within USAID capacity policies and programs that may hinder MSI engagement. The second objective is to create a platform for dialogue. The subcommittee will serve as a dedicated resourced platform for direct dialogue with MSIs. The subcommittee may also recommend methods to track progress and, pro and processes by which USAID could be accountable for use of those methods. The third objective is to strengthen BIFAD's own collaboration with MSIs. The subcommittee will advise the board on approaches to elevate the strengths and perspectives of MSIs within its work, positioning MSIs as recognized thought leaders as BIFAD amplifies the expertise of the U.S. academic community to inform rec recommendations to USAID. The fourth objective is to identify opportunities for USAID to engage with higher education communities, particularly MSIs and underrepresented groups to develop a diverse pipeline of future professionals in global food security, nutrition, and agriculture development. The subcommittee will formulate recommendations to inform USAID strategic engagement with MSIs to deepen institutional focus on access to and preparation for relevant international development career pathways. The draft terms of reference also includes candidate considerations when composing the subcommittee. We envision between seven and 11 formal members with the balance of organizational and geographic perspectives, experience, and expertise. What we are hoping to accomplish through today's meeting is to gain insights from two panels and from the public that will help inform the draft terms of reference, including the objectives and considerations for subcommittee composition. So please do consider sharing feedback about these aspects with us. 
So now I'd like to introduce to you the extraordinary panel of experts who will share their insights and reflections on the opportunities and challenges of federal government partnerships with MSIs. I hope that our conversations will further inform the proposed subcommittee objectives and how they can be operationalized to build upon MSI and federal institutional experiences. So we'll first start with Dr. Mary Beth Gassman, Gassman, who is a distinguished professor and associate dean for research of the Rutgers University Graduate School of Education. She's also executive director of the Rutgers Center for MSIs. Next, Dr. Monty Randall is president of the College of Muskogee Na Nation, and I, I'm not going to mess up this name, in Oklahoma, and he can tell you where in Oklahoma. Dr. Venu Kal Kalabacharla, who is deputy director of the Institute of Youth, Family, and Community within the USA the USDA National Institute of Food Agriculture, or NIFTA, as it's referred to. So let's get started. Dr. Gassman, you've studied the strengths and the assets of MSIs from multiple perspectives throughout your career. What do you see as particular strengths of this diverse class of institutions that make them well-suited for federal government partnership? These may differ from the institutional profile. Can you tell us a little about that? Absolutely, uh, and thanks for the great question. Uh, the uh, So I'll say a couple of things. One, MSIs have a rich diversity of students across many areas, so including race and ethnicity, religion, language, class, just a really, really rich uh, group of students to draw from, which is important. Um, mm -hmm. MSIs have culturally re relevant curricula rooted in diverse communities. That's absolutely essential to USAID's work from my perspective. Um, MSIs have a service orientation, especially within local and regional communities, uh, incredibly important given the work that uh, USAID does. And then lastly, many MSIs have a land grant mission, which makes them ideal partners uh, with USAID. They have, uh, you know, an obligation to the region and the community. And so... What are the some of the structural barriers to these partnerships on both the MSI, MSI side and the federal government side to, that kind of makes it difficult? Always a good question and one I like to answer. I'd say with regard to MSIs, many of them lack a built out sponsored programs office, um, an elaborate sponsored programs office, making it hard to man manage federal contracts and, and federal engagement. And so uh, more support in that area is really beneficial. And then with regard to the federal government, I think a barrier uh, that many MSIs face, and I would just say institutions in general, is excessive paperwork that is required by the federal government. And I bring this up because it's connected to the first uh, barrier, which is not not having large built out offices yeah. related to sponsored programs, which means that that paperwork can be really cumbersome. Okay, thank you. Dr. Randall, the College of the Muskogee Nation, is, it's a small institution with an enrollment of about 200 students to 70 faculty, which is pretty incredible, you know, one to one Ooh. ratio of staff members. Despite the size, you are successfully partnering on federal funding from a variety of agencies and departments, including USDA, NSF, NEH, and HHS. Drawing from that experience, can you share reflections on models that have worked particularly well for your institution and why they work so well? Yes, thank you. Um, College of the Muskogee Nation, uh, um, located in Okmulgee, Oklahoma. Ah, that's, thank you. <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's also the uh, tribal capital of the Muskogee Creek Nation as well. So, yeah, models of, of success for CMN, you know, and, and um, you know, like a lot of tribal colleges, you know, our, our mission is focused on emphasizing Native culture, values, language, and self-determination of, of our people. And, and, you know, so for us, the, the model that has been consistent for us in, in receiving those, those grants and creating those partnerships with, those, with the federal agencies uh, has always been to focus on 
maintaining and emphasizing that that legacy of our heritage and our culture, really creating a, a cultural curriculum, a framework for you know our student learning assessments, all the way through our mission, you know, and and implementing that and and keeping that as the focus of who we are and the objectives to to strengthen our nation. So, you know, th for us, that is the model of success is mm -hmm. is always recognizing that legacy of, of who we are as a people. And is is the the construct of the awards? I mean, would you benefit if there were greater flexibility in it? And and how could they better meet your needs? Yeah, the the flexibility. Um, you know, if, if um, you know, we could look at maybe some sort of cultural assessments or mm -hmm. you know th those types of evaluations. You know, I, I think I think that would definitely lend, you know, to tribal colleges. You know, maybe receiving more awards or, or finalizing, you know, the awards that we do receive. But but definitely, you know, having that that flexibility, you know, built in, um, is something that would benefit us. Okay, thanks, Dr. Randall. Dr. Calavacharla, did I did I do yes. okay? <laughs> yeah, you can just call me Cal. That's good. Even easier, Cal. Um, yeah. You lead funding with with NIFA's Division of Community and Education, which supports students, faculty training, and institutional capacity strengthening to, to conduct applied research and related community development program. Can you share approaches to accomplish goals around MSI engagement in research and also in developing future professionals, which it's, you know, it's so important to, to yep. develop the next group, the next generation coming through? Definitely. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Moore. And I uh, just want to take time for one second to just thank Dr. Cohen from BIFAD, as well as Chancellor Alexander uh, and members of USAID for this very timely discussion. Uh, my background is steep in the land-grant system, as well as in MSIs, I, in which I work for a long time, mentoring, teaching, conducting research, and working with extension. And currently, my, uh, my portfolio at uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture's uh, National Institute for Food and Agriculture, NIFA, which is the extramural funding agency uh, in the institute that I serve in, Institute of Youth, Family, and Community, uh, deals with all the MSIs uh, that are related to food, agriculture, natural resources, and human sciences. So all the 1890 land grants, uh, all the tribal colleges and universities, the 1994s, uh, and uh, President Randall, great to see you. I think we have a trip in September to your uh, institute. And uh, uh, with the Hispanic serving institutions, our Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, as well as our insular area institutions. And so we've taken a very thoughtful course for engaging with the USS minority serving institutions. NIFA mm -hmm. regularly conducts uh, strategic outreach to MSI through quarterly leadership meetings, monthly meet director meetings with the land grant directors with the MSI leadership, uh, outreach at professional organizations and training for MSIs to be successful in implementing NIFA programs. Uh, as other uh, speakers have mentioned earlier, MSIs have a trove of knowledge on addressing many of the issues that affect our nation as well as internationally. And we're trying to figure out how to develop that further. Uh, just brief examples and feel free to uh, stop me and move to the next question whenever you feel like, uh, is that in consultation with stakeholders, that was the most important is to consult with our tribal college and universities, with our 1890s, with their HSIs and, and all our other MSIs. Uh, we organize our calls with our leadership. These meetings help address specific needs of these institutions, common administrative requirements to strengthen financial management and help USDA and NIFA identify challenges and opportunities in underserved communities that need federal action. And these have received really fed, uh, favorable reviews from the attendees. And mm -hmm. since many of us have worked there at MSIs, we understand the struggles that small institutions and MSIs have. And uh, uh, I, I think, uh, Dr. Gassman, you had mentioned earlier about the lack of the resources regarding sponsored programs, Office of Sponsored Research, uh, Restricted Funds Accounting. So uh, one of the initiatives that I had started recently or restarted at NIFA was 
developing mock panels for our various competitive programs. And we have like a 22, 23 page script of mock panels that we all developed and we take it on the road. We go to, we went to Falcon last year. We went to the 1890 Association of Research Directors Extension uh, uh, Administrators meeting and we actually performed there. And now we have that on our website, right? Uh, and then the other piece really is we work with our Office of Grants and Financial Management as a collaboration between myself and my colleague, Deputy Director uh, in NIFA, on how to be compliant with federal rules and regulations because they're there for a reason, uh, you know, and, and so we conduct all of these information and workshops on that. I'll pause there for a second in case you have a follow-up. Yeah. No, I mean, that that's, thank you for elaborating on that because that's why we're here to really, you know, right understand what works and what doesn't. Let's go back first to Dr. Gassman, um, who's led Rutgers Center for MSIs now for, for over a decade. The center partners with 10 federal agencies and also works directly with MSIs and their leadership. Dr. Gassman, how would you characterize produ productive federal partnership models and what differentiates them from ones that are not? Uh, another great question. So um, I think that the best partnerships are those with um, regular communication. And by communication, I don't just mean email. I mean either Zoom or in person that's monthly or more and that and that these partnerships are equitable. And that would mean that both partners are learning from each other and both partners are benefiting. And that doesn't always happen in partnerships with MSIs. I also think it's really important that partnerships have a clear and straightforward sort of memo of understanding defining the partnership as well as funding to support the various aspects of the partnership. And I will say that there've been many um, experiences where MSIs are named in a partnership, but really don't get any of the funding. And so there are some deep inequities that happen in partnerships, federal or non-federal. And so uh, these things are really important to kind of lay it out there and to be open to learning from each other and, and being equitable. Yeah, and, and when you talk about it, you know, the what's in it for me on both sides, that's very, very, very important to any, you know, relationship. Mm -hmm. And when expectations are misaligned, um, you know, it, it doesn't go as far as it could. What could we do, the proposed subcommittee, to take care of this and address that, that important need? So I'm going to be kind of blunt here, but um, these are the things that, um, you know, I've been doing work related to MSIs for almost 25 years. And so I just would want to point out, I, I do want to go back to that sort of excessive paperwork involved in setting up partnerships. And really, it can be very off-putting. But more than that, MSIs tend to have very small staffs doing multiple jobs compared to majority institutions. Of course, there are larger MSIs, but a lot of them have smaller um, staffs and smaller re and, and a smaller amount of resources. So all the paperwork can mean that the partnership doesn't happen right away or or it takes considerable time to get off the ground. And so those things need to be kept in mind. I also think that MSIs and the federal government are often speaking different languages. And it's important to sort of cut through the jargon and use clear language for partnerships. And that's advice I would give to anybody. Uh, and then lastly, I'd say MSIs are from my vantage point, they're about action and making a difference in mm -hmm. communities that they serve. And so federal agencies uh, would benefit from listening to the needs of MSIs in that vein. So in a partnership, having an attitude of, I'm here to learn, I'm here to listen, MSIs can be the teacher um, in terms of what we're about to do. Uh, I think that's incredibly important. Okay, great, great answer. Um, I'm still going to respect you, so I'm going to call you Dr. Cal. <laughs> One of the proposed objectives for the BIFAD subcommittee is to create a platform for yeah. direct dialogue across MSIs and with USAID. Right. How has USDA developed and supported a community and interconnected network of partner MSIs? And then what lessons can you share from your experience? 
Absolutely. So as you know, NIFA supports uh, ag agricultural workforce development, and I use the word ag, but it's broad, uh, food, agriculture, natural resources, human sciences, by offering fellowships, training opportunities that prepare students, teachers, and faculty, and researchers for a variety of careers in the STEM ag pipeline. And some of these programs support development of future professionals, including research and extension, experience for undergraduates. And as you may have heard, last week, Wednesday, was when Secretary Wilsack uh, announced the $262 million uh, you know, next-gen uh, program, which falls into my portfolio as well. And so one of the things that we did there and, uh, uh, you know, is that we intentionally had listening sessions for, we have listening sessions for all of our proposed programs, of course, and for our RFAs and, our, and we have webinars. But in addition to that, we wanted to find out how we can meaningfully have MSIs collaborate with each other as well as our 1862 land grant partners. And so in the next gen uh, proposal uh, uh, program, for example, MSIs are the lead on that. So well, that means that we're listening to them, right? And what Dr. Gasman has mentioned, you know, I've been on that side. I've been a, a mm -hmm. broadened funding uh, to, to the institution that I served in. But I think really uh, the example, one example that I can point out to that NIFA has done, USDA has done recently is that we have one mailbox for our MSIs, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, we have, I have five different groups of MSIs and we're experimenting with one of them. So both program, which is what I represent here, which is uh, all the grants folks, the people who are reviewing the proposals, bringing in people to review proposals, et cetera, and our operations, which is our grants management, the financial people, we all get emails as one mailbox from our MSIs. So if the 8090s want to send an email, they'll send it to that 8090 at usda.gov. And then we all look at it as a team. The other piece is that we have really taken time to go and recruit panelists for our competitive grant programs. Because if you're not in the room, you're not represented, right? And so that's that's been really key to all everything that we have done. Yeah, but I, you know, the the being in the room or virtual or whatever email just never conveys what you want to convey. So I think you know Absolutely. somehow being in the space is important. Yeah. So, so Dr. Randall, I'd like to give you the last word on, on um, this panel. In preparing for this conversation, you shared with our team that while the College of the Muscogee Nation does not currently have an international grant portfolio, you recently applied for funding that would support work across the Caribbean. As you think about future international opportunities, what would make a federal partnership particularly attractive to an institution like yours with no history of USAID collaboration? Yes, thank you. Um, you know, we, we recently uh, worked uh, through a partnership um, with all, bringing all three of the land grant institutions in Oklahoma together. Uh, Langston and Oklahoma State, and so we uh, had a proposal for that uh, for that grant uh, to include the Caribbean. And you know, unfortunately, we we didn't receive that grant. But you know, internationally, you know, uh, the indigenous populations, you know, ha have a lot to offer in this partnership. Um, you know, we are working on research to um, to to look into a a cultural and traditional uh, plant, uh, fruit plant that grows in the southeastern part of the United States and, and researching how we can replicate that growth in the area that we are in now as Muscogee people, as we were removed from our, uh, our ancestral homelands to where we mm -hmm. are today to see if we can, uh, you know, replicate that growth. And so, you know, indigenous knowledge is you know it, it is just is underrepresented and there's a lot to offer you know through leadership through culture through the language um you know through traditional practices and customs of of agriculture you know there's a lot to offer yeah. uh, and and you know if, if we could come together across you know internationally with indigenous populations 
you know, to, to work together and, you know, to, to show our best practices, you know, amongst each other. I, th I think that's, you know, a really good opportunity, you know, and, and reasoning for, you know, for the College of Muskogee Nation and all tribal colleges, you know, to start looking at, at international research and international studies. Yeah. And, and when we are, when you look at, when the proposed subcommittee can look at um, how to explore developing a diverse pipeline for future professionals in international agriculture, food security, and nutrition, what should the subcommittee consider to reach out, for example, students in your natural resources program, as an example? Yes, I, I think, um, you know, a consideration is, you know, specifically, you know, technically oriented, you know, uh, training and research opportunities for our students, you know, um, and faculty as well, you know, faculty lead a lot of the this research and, and, you know, bring it to our students. So, you know, technical training, uh, you know, on, you know, on that, on that grants management side, on the proposals and and even you know the the research um, you know I I, I echo what, what Dr. Gasman talked about you know small staff size you know 70 right. um, 70 employees you know and that's with about 10 or 12 full-time faculty for us so you know those considerations um, you know for our for our faculty and staff and students um, on the on the grants. Well, with that, I want to thank our panelists for sharing their expertise and experience, which um, is really, you know, will help shape the discussion. All of these insights will. And um, we really want to enrich how the proposed subcommittee objectives are refined and operationalized. Um, so now we would like to open the floor to my fellow BIFAB members who I think have some questions for our panelists. So um, our audience members, the public comment period is coming up after the next panel. So please hold your questions and propose it in the Q&A and we'll get to those soon. So with that, I think I wanna start with Sawita. Um, I know you had a question. Uh, you're you're at, Min at Michigan State which is not an MSI, but you know, you're know you working in the space of, of students of color. So what is your question? Um, thank you so much, Henri, and um, thanks to the panelists for their excellent reflections and points. Uh, quite a number of questions came to mind, but for the sake of time, I'm actually just gonna ask one at this point, and that's to um, Professor Gassman. Um, so you touched very nicely upon some examples about successful federal partnership models and you highlighted the importance of both partners learning from each other and um, the important role that that plays for the success of the relationship. And you also talked about the importance of learning, right, and listening. And so um, I'm just wondering, you know, how can federal agencies and USAID in particular more explicitly, you know, what are some thoughts you have about how we can, they can more explicitly incorporate the appetite to learn from MSI partners and to put that learning into practice. Thank, Thank you. you for the question. I, I really appreciate that. And um, so this is something I think about all the time. Uh, whenever we partner with people, we tend to bring people together before the partnership begins to um, first like kind of get everyone on the same page in terms of um, what the partnership is going to be about. But also we have, uh, both let's say there were two partners we have both partners lead sessions so that it doesn't appear that all of the knowledge is flowing only from um, one side right so that it looks like you're learning together and learning from each other and i do think it's a really good idea to to ensure that um if if you're on the majority side if you're on the federal side in this case that you talk to the people involved and say we need to be open to learning. You have explicit conversations and then explicit time where you can talk through that, you know, to, to just have honest conversation. That works, an honest, straightforward conversation. Great. Thank you. And Marie, do you have a question? 
Yes. Um, first, thank you to all of the panelists um, for their remarks. And this question builds on some of Henri's earlier questions. Dr. Kalavacharla and Dr. Randall, could either of you share any experiences of federal program approaches that maybe didn't work as well that USAID could learn from? I could just say that uh, you may or may not know this, uh, that NIFA had to move from Washington, D.C. to uh, Kansas City uh, in, I think it was 2018. This was a couple of years before I started here. But I know that there was a lot of delays and struggles at that time because we lost a lot of our staff. And now we've really built back. We're at full capacity and are there to serve. Uh, but I can definitely address uh, some of what uh, uh, Dr. Liverpool Tassi had said earlier with regards to engagement. If we, so USDA uh, uh, is like the way I look at it, and NIFA, National Institute for Food and Agriculture, is the bus that is carrying the funding that Congress appropriates to the stakeholders, right? Or the administration proposes. So we are uh, asked to work on it very carefully, very diligently. So we do a lot of the public consultation in order to make sure that we're hitting hitting the mark on it. But I'll, I'll stop there, but I can follow up separately as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Cal, Dr. Gassman, Dr. Randall for, for your time and your insight. It, it's going to be very helpful uh, for the subcommittee. And so with that, I think I will pass it back to Lawrence. Thank you, Henri, uh, for leading that very rich conversation. Uh, we will now turn to Dr. LaVon Esters uh, for our next presentation. Dr. Esters is the Vice Provost for Graduate Education and Dean of the Graduate School at the Pennsylvania State University. Dr. Esters also led a 2020 consultancy on the state of MSI collaborations with USAID Feed the Future Innovation Labs. LaVon? Thank you, uh, Lawrence. Uh, as Henry mentioned earlier, this is not the first time that BIFAD has concerned itself with MSI engagement in USAID agriculture food security programming. So I would like to share an overview of BIFAD's past work in this area and an assessment I conducted on collaboration between US university-led agricultural and food security research programs known as Feed the Future Innovation Labs and MSIs over the past decade or so. So um, I'm going to take a few minutes to uh, give you an overview of this consulting report that uh, and I need to acknowledge Victoria Parker, who is currently my doctoral student, uh, who assisted me with this report that we did in 2020. And uh, we also uh, just so happens that we're conducting a follow-up report to that here in 2023. One thing I wanted to start out with was this quote. And this quote was actually taken from the survey uh, um, that we collected this year from uh, Innovation Lab directors. And uh, Victoria and I were texting, texting about this and, and she actually, I need to give her credit, she felt uh, it necessary for me to include this on uh, the slide. And so it, it, this quote reads, in 1890, be, being a prime on a food Feed the Future Innovation Lab would be a great asset to the portfolios of Feed the Future Innovation Labs. And this was mentioned by Feed the Future Innovation Lab director. So I just want to set the tone today, if you will, with this quote. So I'm going to give you uh, this introduction. I'm going to provide a problem statement that Victoria and I, uh, that we outlined when we did this report in 2020, the methodology, the conclusions, the recommendations, and then, of course, at the end of this session, we have some Q&A. So just some introductory comments uh, about this topic. Uh, as many of you know, many MSIs are prepared for collaborative opportunities. We've talked about that today. Uh, Dr. Gass and others talked about MSIs and, and the strengths they bring to the table that would enhance innovation lab projects like extensive experience work with populations who reflect uh, cultural diversity. Uh, they're sensitive to the condition of developing countries. They have well-established networks. There's considerable agriculture-related technical expertise at these institutions. 
Uh, they're familiar with the constraints experienced by low income in rural communities, for example, that can be extrapolated to other uh, contexts. And there's also, also a lot of enthusiasm um, about creating new partnerships across different MSIs and between MSIs and other types of universities. So the problem that Victoria and I kind of sought out uh, was uh, <clears throat> that we kind of started to drift towards as we immersed ourselves in literature was that despite MSIs having these characteristics that I just previously mentioned and described, and the fact that faculty have this expertise to contribute to addressing global brand challenges tied to agriculture and food security, there still has not been much progress at the end of the day made at USAID in increasing collaboration between Innovation Labs and MSIs. So just to give you some background about the methodology we use, uh, we administered, when we did this 2020 study, a quadric survey to 18 USA Innovation Lab directors, one USA Innovation Lab program manager, and one USA program administrator. But we had questions pertaining to demographics, knowledge of MSIs, collaboration with MSIs, and their interest in attending this work session that uh, Victoria and I uh, facilitated. And we also conducted some pre-work session phone interviews with a selected group of these 21 Innovation Lab directors. They were six uh, in total. And we did this to gain a better understanding of their level of engagement and collaboration with MSIs. We also uh, conducted or disseminated whole survey instruments uh, to Innovation Lab personnel. Again, in this survey, when I'll be a project to 59 Innovation Lab individuals, we had questions pertaining to work sessions, usefulness, as that was the work session they attended, knowledge gained from attending the work session, work session critiques, and uh, their collaboration with MSIs as well. We also conducted a post survey instrument with USAID personnel. Uh, this was administered by 40 USAID individuals. Uh, we had questions pertaining to, again, the usefulness of the work session, knowledge of MSIs, collaboration with MSIs, and work session critiques as well. So based on, we collected this data, right? And so uh, Victoria and I came with several conclusions. And we also have a set of recommendations that I'll share with you in a few slides. Conclusion one, uh, based on, again, the data we collected from uh, in 2020, work session participants had very little knowledge about the various types of MSIs. Overall, the participants indicated low levels of networking and collaboration with MSIs at that time. Uh, Participants also expressed interest, however, in collaborating with MSIs. However, they were unaware of how to approach engaging in these collaborative partnerships. Also, the participants found the work session very useful and informative. Um, they also indicated collaborating with MSIs would enhance the impact and expand the reach of their innovation lab projects. Uh, participants also indicated that future innovation lab and USA annual meetings should include work sessions focusing on increasing collaboration with MSIs. And participants also indicate uh, USAID should explore strategies that would help ensure MSI collaboration. So you have these seven uh, conclusions that we uh, came up with. And so Victoria and I came up with these recommendations. Um, one, we believe, uh, we, can, we recommend, excuse me, at the time, that a permanent subcommittee uh, that focuses on MSI collaboration should be created as part of the BIFAD. Secondly, USA, uh, USA MSI task force that was recommended and approved all the way in 2011 should be reestablished and fully supported. Number three, USA in partnership with BIFAD should commission a white paper or study for that matter that addresses the topic of MSI collaboration. And USA should also create an ongoing program session as part of the Innovation Lab and USA annual meeting that focuses on MSI, MSI collaboration. And then the last four, uh, we believe that USA in partnership with BIFAD, APLU, and USDA, NEFA should organize a convening on MSI collaboration. We also believe that USA should host workshops for MSIs that focus on how to develop competitive applications for USA funding, as well as a workshop for Innovation Lab personnel that focus on evaluating proposals fairly and equitably. USA should also conduct a follow-up study with Innovation Labs every three to five years to evaluate the progress made on the development and maintenance of MSI partnership efforts. And lastly, we believe that USA should conduct a follow-up study with the MSI partner institutions 
every three to five years to learn their perspectives on the progress being made regarding the development and maintenance of the partnership. So that brings you to the end of this portion of, of my session. And so now we're going to, um, I'd like to introduce two experts uh, who will share their thoughts on MSI technical expertise and capacity relevant to USAID's food security and nutrition program. I hope that our conversation will inform the proposed subcommittee's membership plan to ensure the representation of diverse technical viewpoints. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Saul Jimenez Sandoval, who is the president of California State University, Fresno. Fresno State is home of the Jordan College of Agricultural Sciences and Technology, which supports nearly 2,000 undergraduate and graduate students and an array of specialized agricultural research centers. We also have Kia, Kia Jones, excuse me, who is a PhD candidate in rural sociology and international agriculture develop, development at Penn State University. So glad to have a fellow Penn Stater here. And also the Manners Region One graduate student vice president. As an undergraduate, she was a USDA 1890 scholar at Virginia State University, which is an 1890, of course, land grant HBCU. And she also led, has held multiple intern positions across the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So with that as, as an introduction to these two individuals, uh, I'm going to proceed with my first question to Saul. So Saul, Fresno State is located in California's Central Valley, bread basket and a produce basket for the whole country. Can you tell our board and audience about the diversity of agriculture expertise that your institution supports, and how it addresses the priorities of your broader community? Thank you very much for that. And it's great to see you uh, today, uh, Dr. Esters. Uh, glad to be here uh, with all of you. Um, I'll start by providing some basic numbers. Uh, the city of Fresno is the ninth, number nine, most diversity in the US. And it is also the fifth largest city in all of California. We are also located in the most agriculturally productive region in the world and in the history of the world as well. Uh, we currently produce, you mentioned produce, uh, we currently produce uh, over 40%, 40% of the fresh fruits and vegetables for the entire US, for the entire country. So within this context, Fresno State has a robust curriculum in agriculture. Fresno State's main focus is to further the power of food production and processing both. Um, our Jordan College of Agriculture is the lead at Fresno State, but almost every single department on campus works with agriculture with one level or another. Uh, scientists from three colleges, that's agriculture, engineering, and science, um, collectively collaborate in a state-of-the-art facility called the Jordan Agricultural Research Center, where they work to solve some of the most difficult subjects in agriculture, food, and natural resources. So I'll give you two examples uh, of this very specifically. Uh, due to the climate change that we're all experiencing, farmers in the Central Valley are increasingly experiencing water scarcity and higher water source salinity. So that's uh, salt in the water. Uh, farmers either have to dig uh, deeper wells or use poor quality uh, with more saline uh, for uh, agricultural production. Of course, this is not good for the crops. The team from Agriculture, Engineering and Science have developed precision separation technology to remove uh, phytotoxic uh, constituents and nutrients from poor water sources. With this technology, farmers can use local water and nutrient sources for fertigation and irrigation, thus reducing agriculture's dependence on fertilizers and imported water. And also, of course, safeguarding food security uh, for the entire country and the world as well. So the, the second example that I have deals with Fresno State and how it embodies this concept of farm to fork. Uh, we have departments that address a range of topics from the production of food on the farm, uh, food storage, food processing, transfer logistics, consumption, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, communities across the country, not just the Central Valley, experience food supply chain challenges during the pandemic. Uh, food security is important to our community. Food security is also a national security issue though. Uh, this year, uh, USDA uh, allocated $420 million to 12 regional food business centers to adjust the food supply chain issue. Our agriculture college uh, will take up a leadership role in one of these regional food uh, business centers called the Southwest USDA Regional Food Business Center. Uh, 
this new regional center is part of a collaborative that is led by the University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources. Importantly, Fresno State will be joining collaborators from across uh, all of California, Nevada, Arizona, and Utah to tackle the difficult issue of building a resilient food system in the United States, which of course also impacts the entire world. Uh, what made Fresno State attractive as a partner was its diverse team of experts. The team on this project includes faculty in ag business, industrial technology, uh, food science and nutrition departments, um, as well as others from the business college and also from the water energy and technology center that we have at Fresno State. I'll end my remarks on this issue by saying that our faculty and students are in constant communication with local producers and local industry processors, whether it's pest management or maximizing water or development of new productive hybrids. We have a very, very strong contingency of faculty in all uh, who will partner in a very close relationship with our industry partners as well. So thank you for that question. Yeah, thank you, So um, appreciate that response to that question. So I do have a follow-up, and so my follow-up is this. What are the sure. skills required to effectively translate research and technolo technology, technological, excuse me, technological development into practice at scale? Yeah, so our ag research at Fresno State is not theoretical. It's very much applied and it always speaks to the bottom line. We don't do research that's, you know, that just sits on a shelf. We do research that actually uh, uh, collectively and assertively uh, will create a positive change. Hence, our professors are involved in ag research that must be robust enough to make a difference to the bottom line. Likewise, our students are immersed in a setting that demands a broader understanding of how their work or their research would translate to and positively impact the real world, so the farmers in our region specifically. Uh, several faculty are engaged with our local producers. For example, uh, B Sweet Citrus, one of the largest citrus uh, independent packers and shippers of citrus in the nation, uh, partnered with us to set up a citrus pack in line in the industrial technology department. Uh, we are the only school in the country, and I will say this, the only school in the country with the citrus packing line. Importantly as well, our faculty in the industrial technology department have worked with B-Suite on packing line process and control. Um, and then our faculty in the uh, food science and nutrition department have worked with Wawona Foods to help the company identify ways in which it could reduce water use in its processing plants. Water is it critical fundamental element in our region. The company reports very happily that their work has resulted in millions of waters, uh, of, of gallons of water savings. Um, with our 1,000 acre farm, uh, we have 1,000 acres uh, of a farm in at, our, at Fresno State. Our students learn from agricultural practices that are done at scale, but are immediately translatable into industry practice. For example, we planted 25 acres uh, just this season um, of corn, sweet corn, and we have a 6,000 case winery on campus. Our students produce the wine and sell the wine as well. And uh, we have a 300 head uh, of dairy as well. So they put the theory into practice and gain valuable hands-on experience. And of course, this provides them with uh, great scalability in, within the industry once they graduate. Thank you. So, I mean, to say what you, you. shared is, is, is impressive as an understatement. So, I really appreciate that. So, Kia, um, you have experience with both domestic and international agricultural research applications. So, these two research communities of practice do not always overlap, as you can imagine. So, what do you think is important for both students and faculty and the agricultural scientists to understand about international applications for their work? Thank you. I hope that all students and faculty understand that all of their research has policy implications. So international researchers may be studying the same problems as those domestically, and all applications may be context dependent, but it is important to consider that international solutions are also available for our domestic problems. I hope that students and faculty consider these international solutions to the problems that are uniquely domestic and vice versa. Um, in international com communities, um, they're considering and they're also influenced by the solutions and recommendations that we produce with our research domestically. And is it, it is important to consider the breadth of international applicability for your research when you jump into it. 
Um, students and faculty should also be experienced with policy development, research application and extension, and reflect on the processes to better understand the development of policy based on their research. Thank you. Uh, so I want to come back to you uh, for uh, briefly. Um, are there aspects of the work that your agricultural faculty, staff, and students conduct, or strengths for that matter, that they bring to work both individually and collectively that translate particularly well to resource-constrained developing country settings? And if so, what are they? Sure. Thank you for that again, uh, Levon. Um, one of the strengths that our faculty and staff bring is the awareness that agriculture is an ecosystem um, and that everyone needs to participate in it, whether you're in the farm or not. Uh, again, the city of Fresno is the ninth most diverse city in the country. And at Fresno State, we are an HSI and an NFPC institution. So Fresno State reflects the diversity of the region in a pretty concrete way. Um, with an 85, 85% non-white population of our students at Fresno State, um, we are at the for forefront of educating leaders who navigate multiple levels of cultural mastery uh, because agriculture is it, it, in the Valley is the most important enterprise. The needs of small scale and medium scale farmers, minority and underserved groups, farm workers and others are front and center at Fresno State. The pandemic elevated this issue in a pretty concrete way because the small scale and individual farmers were much more nimble in addressing food supply chain issues than the large scale farmers were. Uh, consequently, many of our faculty and staff are working directly with these areas of opportunities or uh, writing grant you know, uh, proposals as well that support their work with under-resourced groups. For example, the Dairy Pacific Coast Coalition, a Fresno State-led uh, USDA-funded initiative seeks to support the dairy product industry among small and ethnically diverse dairy processors. Faculty in the Lyles Business uh, School um, also help minority farmers write business plans. And those in the agriculture uh, uh, college provide resource constrained producers with technical help. So it's, a, it's an ecosystem that comes together beautifully with our diverse students, our faculty, and then our region and our industry partners as well. Thank you. Thank you, So, Akia, uh, you've been a student leader within three diverse institutions of higher education in addition to your role in Manners. Uh, drawing from those academic experiences, what would you suggest are the types of, of perspectives or backgrounds that would add value to the deliberations of a standing MSI subcommittee focused on USAID agricultural food security and nutrition policy and program? Yes, um, as an early career person myself um, and a third year PhD student, um, I've been through several institutions at this point and I think that um, a commitment to international research activity and a commitment to service adds value to this committee. Uh, I think that the committee should engage with early career professionals within um, both the university setting and private industry. Uh, I think both um, yield certain perspectives and values. Um, and especially now, more PhD students and young graduates are seeking expertise and opportunities within industry and extension applications. Um, so look for those early career professionals um, that are halfway into their postdocs um, or early in industry and consulting um, or involved in entrepreneurship themselves. I believe that um, the early career professionals within the university setting have unique perspectives. Um, they would like to share their knowledge and expertise with new um, upcoming generations, which is so valuable. Um, they would like to continue researching some of these issues that are um, extensive, um, domestically challenging, internationally challenging, which is important, um, but also the young career professionals that are involved in entrepreneurship, um, consulting, and industry have, inter have unique perspectives in that um, they're innovative, um, they push beyond boundaries, uh, they seek some uh, 
unconventional solutions to the issues that we're facing uh, in agriculture and nutrition. Um, I think both should be considered when seeking value for this committee. Um, on the uh, service side, um, I think that students and professionals should believe in a commitment to service, um, whether it's through organizations like Manners or local organizations, the commitment to service uh, shows that they are uh, pushing boundaries um, to solve problems that align with their values. Um, and I would say that, that involvement in organizations like Manners will give students and professionals perspectives on important issues, both in the industry and in their communities, as well as perspectives on the MSI landscape. Um, commitment to service will show that there's a personal commitment to filling gaps within industry and sharing their expertise with students and you or students and professionals of all backgrounds are willing and capable to share their expertise through manners and organizations like manners. Um, finally, I believe that students should also or students and professionals should also make training available. Uh, we all have something to share um, with both students and professionals at MSI institutions and students of underrepresented backgrounds at um, non-MSI non institutions. Um, yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Kia. Uh, before I go to uh, my follow-up question, I just, I wanna acknowledge and, and just make clear that I really appreciate uh, your perspective. I mean, you know, sharing what you just have, what you, what you just shared, excuse me, what you just shared regarding early career aspect is important and and my hope and anticipation is that those who make the decision when it's time to select the committee keeps that in mind so i really appreciate that so having said that how should the subcommittee frame or focus its analysis of usaid engagement with early career individuals kia thank you um sorry could you repeat that yeah how should the subcommittee frame or focus its analysis of USAID engagement with early career individuals? Hmm. Um, I believe that early career individuals um, uh, were at a place in our lives uh, where some things aren't set in stone. And I think that's so valuable. Um, we have the knowledge of uh, the interests of new generations and that should be taken into account when um, choosing these subcommittee members. Um, the perspective of these early career professionals may be new and unconventional, um, but it will give insight into problems that are upcoming, problems that are in the future um, that we don't recognize currently. So I think understanding that the perspectives may be unconventional, um, but it is important to understand that this is the future or these early career professionals are the future and they may understand um, difficult things that are difficult for um, the new generations coming up. So. Thank you, Kia. So I want to come back to you uh, for a moment. Uh, so what are the challenges of your faculty and staff in applying their knowledge and expertise internationally? Yeah, so I first want to say uh, that I 100% agree with Kia. I think these these uh, voices, these fresh voices with diverse creative ideas are, are critical uh, to, to all of our enterprise. And secondly, I want to highlight the great number of people I've seen on chat who have tuned in to this uh, from abroad. Specifically, I noticed those located in Africa. So a, a great greeting to all of you. Um, the challenges fall into three broad areas in my mind. Um, one is international grants and contracts. Uh, funding resources may be governmental or non-governmental and typically require much more extensive reporting, uh, which is quite burdensome and, and quite overwhelming, um, as well as different administrative procedures that are based on international protocols, which is not the case with more traditional U.S. funding sources. Uh, staff tend to be a bit more hesitant and less familiar 
with new international policies and procedures uh, necessary for implementation of awards. Um, so th that the expertise, you know, and how to navigate these protocols, uh, number one, I think is, is first and foremost in my mind. A first step would be, in my mind, to resolve this, to have USDA and other granting agencies have clear guidance on implementation and reporting requirements and the reassurance that support will be provided throughout the grant or contract cycle. Uh, the second one that I have in mind um, deals with, um, we have a set of the art, science and technical expertise um, in the agricultural sector. But as Fresno State, we are often overlooked by key government agencies because we are within the ecosystem of California where we have to navigate giants uh, specifically, you know, other universities that take up much more attention on the national and international uh, spectrum, even though we are the ones producing, again, 40% of the fresh fruits and vegetables for the entire nation. So in addition, um, nationwide, very few know of the intrinsic value that the Central Valley brings to the food security and diet diversity of the US. Uh, we grow food that brings you joy. We, we grow the colors that stand out in the plate that are both nutritious and that are both attractive as well. So indeed, after our commodities leave the farm gate and are shipped overseas or they're shipped nationwide, the brand of California overtakes the importance of the Central Valley. And the Central Valley is just simply forgotten or lost within this huge, bigger brand of California or within this big you know, ecosystem that California is. Uh, recent events in Ukraine and the COVID pandemic have demonstrated the vulnerability of the global food supply and have brought the value of this Central Valley to the center stage for the nation and for the world as well. So I'm gonna give you a possible solution to this. Um, it might be that government and private sector partners do a better job at reaching out to diverse institutions like the ones we've seen today here that bring real value rather than limiting collaborations to smaller set of established uh, you know, institutions so I'm advocating for the boots on the ground partners who have the advantage of understanding the opportunity landscape better and those uh, whose research is applied and has an immediate impact on the food supply. And number three then in general, since a large percentage of our students come from underrepresented and low income groups, again, you know, 85% of my students are non-white. Many of our students do not participate in study abroad opportunities um, at a large scale. Our students are often focused on the region and do not have this overarching perspective of how their expertise is literally going to impact the food supply and feed uh, the nation and the world. So to address this, we have been working hard at Fresno State to strengthen our international presence. The Global Agriculture and Food Security Initiative, uh, GAFSI, was created out of a need to consolidate all international activity within the Agriculture College in order to better leverage strengths, identify trends and address any deficiencies or challenges that we face uh, relating to our international programs. An example of this is our strong collaboration with the University of the Azores uh, and the Punjab Agricultural University in India as well. In both cases, the exchange of students and faculty has proven to both strengthen our students' understanding of the global food supply, as well as attract top talent faculty who are interested in international collaboration. And I'm gonna end with, uh, with this. Uh, last December, Fresno State uh, signed an MOU with the US Army Civil Affairs and Psychological Operations uh, to provide training via the ADAPT program to our soldiers on the topic of agriculture and food security in order to support um, the Army's mission to help secure our national security space in uh, at-risk regions of the world. Uh, the ADAPT training is typically three days of lectures and field practicum that cover basic agricultural systems of the regions where our troops will deploy. And we also teach assessment and intervention techniques to uh, address threats to local food security. Of course, food is a major source of security. And if we provide that to our partners around the globe, uh, the U.S. standing will uh, elevate in a quite significant way. Uh, right now, our training is focused on the Asia Pacific region. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Uh, so Kia, I'm going to uh, give you the last question. Um, kind of a long one, so follow along with me, please. So Kia, in addition to your broad academic, academic experience, 
you've had a unique vantage point within the U.S. Department of Agriculture, supporting the nominations of members to the National Agriculture Research, Extension Education, and Economics Advisory Board, which provides advice to the Secretary of Agriculture. Do you have any reflections on the strengths of that nominations process to inform BIFAD's work in identifying appropriate subcommittee members? Thank you. Um, during my time at USDA and my time with the NARI board, um, I think that there was a strong commitment to inclusivity of um, MSI um, institutions, um, private companies, and um, government in individuals. Um, so I think that they had, we had like a strong um, process that included all that we could um, for, for fielding nominations. Um, but I would, I would agree that the current board members um, also have a responsibility to contribute to the nominations process in fielding nominations. Um, it shouldn't feel like you're starting over each time feel, you're fielding nominations. Um, as an intern, I was new to the process um, and I didn't have a lot of connections as a 19 year old, um, but the, the current board members do have those connections and they do have an understanding of what it takes to serve on this board. Um, they also understand what they represent and what is not represented in the current committee. So, I would say at the beginning um, of the establishment of each new committee, um, the committee should recognize the qualities, interests, and backgrounds that they bring to the table uh, at that time. Uh, they should develop a reflexivity statement of each of their qualities, interests, and backgrounds and reflect on what is not brought. Um, I would hark back to a game that was played during the Manners May training called Me Too. Uh, where an individual states an interest or characteristic representative of themselves and another person in the group, if they, sh if they shared that trait, would say me too. Um, in this way, you can understand the character characteristics that we share around the table, but also we can go one step further um, and reflect with each other about who and what is not represented within the group. Um, we should recognize these differences and voids early within the term um, and during the fielding process um, and do make a, a list of these traits when you field applications in the future um, to be considerate of um, those perspectives that are not filled within this term. You can fill them within the next term. Um, I know that the committee's time is not up just yet and it, there is still time to do these reflexive exercises um, and nominate people yourself within the committee so i think all of these um, aspects are important when um, understanding the nomination process and building the strongest committee you can um, sorry i'm in colombia if you hear noise no worries thank you yeah thank you uh, so thank you kia uh, i'll start with you by saying again but thank you. I can't say thank you enough. I'm so glad you're at Penn State. I look forward to meeting you in person. So let me get that out of the way. So looking forward to that. Thank you for your contribution today uh, and contributing to what has been a stimulating conversation. And Saul, you know, we met years ago and, and we did. You, were you were phenomenal then and, and you continue to be so today. And, and just Likewise, the, work you're doing at Fresno, yeah, the work you're doing at Fresno State is just, uh, I echo Mayor Best sentiments in, in the chat, like Fresno State is just a phenomenal institution, and I'm Thank so you. glad Thank that, you. That, you, that, you, that you're that leader that they chose. Uh, so now I will invite BIFAT members to ask any questions of our two panelists. Audience members, the public comment period is coming up next, so please post questions or comments you have you may have in the Q&A window, and we will get to those soon. Um, so I see that uh, there are two questions uh, from Pamela and Rattan, so let me take both questions and then turn back to our panelists. So Pamela, you want to go ahead with your question? Thank you, Dr. Esters. Um, and, and thank you to both of the panelists. It was a wonderful session. Um, I, I have a, a question for Dr. Jimenez-Sandoval. 
Um, I want to pick up on the second point that you were making. Um, you mentioned that, because it really resonated, you, you mentioned mm -hmm. that you felt like Fresno State was often overlooked. And, and I mm -hmm. think you have hit on the essence of what we are trying to do with this subcommittee. When you think about the challenges that we have, you know, in the international development arena, we need all of the intellectual and technical capacity that right. we have on deck. So give us some more guidance. I mean, what do you think? And, and the truth is, as we have worked as a board, we have had trouble identifying mm -hmm. who to go to for certain things. So just concretely, what should AID be doing? What should we be doing? How do we, how do we get this hidden marketplace out into the public so that we really can draw on the expertise which you articulated so well this afternoon? What do we need to be thank doing you. completely to fix this? Yeah, thank you so much for that. So I think first and foremost in my mind comes, uh, where is the food being produced, uh, number one? Um, and number two, uh, what type of institution um, is within this ecosystem? Um, in my case, the food is being produced within the Fresno region. Number two, my institution has an 85% uh, non-white population, which means that I graduate on average, 85% of my students represented across the board in every single discipline are non-white. Uh, within this, what do we have? We have a, a perfect set of elements that come together beautifully in which to say, we might not have the sterling, incredible reputation of the other institutions within California. A lot, a lot of times you'll take up all of the attention, but we have the boots on the ground expertise and we have the students with an incredible work ethic on the one hand, and on the other hand, with this powerful connection to the farm uh, that will represent the future of food security as well. So my advice to you is look where the food is being produced and then look after as well those institutions that have the added layers, the added value, such as diversity and, um, and, and the other elements as well. Uh, so, Rutan, uh, your, your question. Thank you, Chair. I greatly appreciated both presentations. Uh, very informative and very, very nice. Uh, my question maybe is also to President Sandoval, but maybe both of them can answer. I was impressed by your statement that the Central Valley produces 40% of the all U.S. fresh fruit, vegetables, and uh, uh, other commodities which are horticultural in nature being affected strongly by climate change, especially by water scarcity and water salinity. At the same time, I was reading a report, in fact, this morning that U.S. and globally we waste, especially U.S., 30% of the food overall, but maybe as much as 50% of the fresh produce that you deal with in Central Valley. So my question to you is twofold. What would you suggest to reduce the food waste or rather make that liability into an asset perhaps? Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, what would your farmer, which are also very diverse, would like uh, BIFAD board and others to consider their needs, uh, which might uh, be useful in forthcoming farm bill, for example, uh, on reducing the waste is improving the productivity and of course, uh, improving soil quality as well. So that's a twofold question. I would ans appreciate your answer, but perhaps Kia could also add something to it. Yeah, I think uh, first and foremost, um, I will say that we need to start thinking of food as a national and international security issue. And we have not done that so far. We have taken for granted the fact that we go to the store and we're able to buy fruits and vegetables at a very economic level and that they're available year round as well. That's another issue, I think. So first and foremost, how do we, how do we bring attention to the food growing areas of the nation, specifically the Central Valley, and how do we empower and value them in furthering their own uh, enterprises? So I would say that that's first and foremost in my mind. The second one dealing with, uh, with food waste, it's very important. There's food waste happening in two levels, you know, from what I see. Food waste happens because there's a ticking time bomb 
from the time that the, the food is uh, harvested to the time that it goes to the packing house and to the time that it's processed and then shipped to the rest of, uh, of the, the country and the world. Uh, we need to shorten the time period in which we uh, package the food, secure it, uh, uh, climate control it immediately so that we stop the clock on how uh, this food uh, is wasted on the farm. That's one. Number two, we in the U.S. are focused on aesthetics to the point of being detrimental. If you go to any other country in the world, you will find fruits and vegetables that have a little scar or that are slightly you know, off. They, they're not perfectly shaped, but we Americans in the US tend to think of food as perfect. We, I want a perfect tomato. I want a perfect lemon. I want a perfect orange. We need to get away from that because we waste a lot of food because it is not aesthetically perfect to the consumer. The other part that comes to mind uh, in all of this is that in terms of food uh, salinity and water, uh, water, uh, uh, water research, we need the support of granting agencies because money equals resources equal research. Research equals a higher productivity of food uh, for not just us, but for the nation and for the world as well. So we need to be very um, conscious about the importance of funding to institutions that have boots on the ground, concrete uh, research that will impact uh, in a greater scale. I'm going to leave the rest of the time so that uh, Kia can respond to some of these as well. Thank you. Um, I'll respond to the food waste question. Um, I think that the committee should also start supporting um, innovations and entrepreneurship that is centered around combating food waste. We already see a few of these emerging companies that are trying to close gaps within the supply chain, um, just giving more of the spotlight to those companies, um, giving those companies more um, marketing value and um, more support would help the food waste problem. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, panelists, and thank you, uh, Pamela and Rattan. So I'm going to transition now back to Lawrence. Thank you, LaVon, uh, and thanks uh, as well to uh, Saul and, and Kia for that, uh, that uh, wonderful panel and your reflections, uh, uh, both on leveraging the deep uh, MSI technical expertise as well as uh, representing that expertise on the proposed uh, subcommittee. Uh, we'll now have the opportunity to turn to and and hear back from our audience. Um, I invite R.T. Franklin, uh, Senior Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Accessibility, or DEIA, advisor in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, to lead that portion of the program. R.T. Thank you, Chancellor Dr. Alexander. Um, it's my pleasure to moderate this public comment period uh, and would like to encourage the participants to provide feedback. If you have any questions for the panelists or a comment pertaining to proposed objectives or membership of the subcommittee, please share them in the Q&A window, which I think you'll find at the bottom. I do see a lot of questions already populating in that window. I will read your feedback and direct any questions to the appropriate panelists. All comments and questions are for attribution uh, and will be retained as a public, excuse me, as part of the public record. They will be compiled for board to review as well as continue to develop this subcommittee's mandate. Please keep your comments and questions uh, on topic and brief. I'll summarize them if needed. And I'll also like to remind everyone that the draft subcommittee terms of reference can be found at www.usaid gov slash bifad will provide the link in the chat. Uh, public comments will be accepted until Wednesday, July 12th, which is two weeks from today. We encourage everyone here to share the TOR with your networks to ensure the stakeholder interests are reflected as the document is revised and finalized over the coming months. With that being said, I'll jump into the very first question. So first question is submitted by 
Uh, Dr. Uh, Matthew Blair from Tennessee State, which is my buddy. How you doing, Dr. Blair? Um, does the question is this? Does USAID have any NOFO RFPs that are exclusive, exclusively for MSIs as lead institutions similar to next gen program mentioned by USDA representatives? Um, I would actually like to take start and take this one. Um, you know, then I, I will, I'm going to segue it open for other comments. So, I believe at the beginning of this of, of the meeting, uh, Councilor White he did highlight that USAID lacks the congressional set asides for MSIs that other federal agencies have. Uh, we are able to restrict eligibility to MSIs when there is a pro programmatic. Uh, rationale for doing this to help expand, you know, the diversity of the agency's partner base. Our recently, you know, our acquisitions strategy existing, we're, we're constantly revamping that with GC and OAA to include language that is emphasizing uh, expanding that partner base. Uh, the other ways, you know, we can kind of look at how we can better help you or support you is uh, ways to enable the MSI to su successfully compete for the USA awards are, uh, I think uh, Dana Alzuma mentioned this before she put it in the chat box, which is work with USAID.org website. It helps new potential partners prepare to work with us. And it also, it, it, it kind of helps you get a good gauge of what we're looking for in a partner. Um, with that comment, I'm going to go ahead and leave that open for comment for uh, our MSI coordinator, Dana Alzuma, and see if she might have anything to add to this. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, I'd just like to add a couple of things. Um, at this moment, I'm not aware of any particular NOFOs at this time, but it's so important to do things like, for instance, visit our work with USAID.org. And also sign up for our business forecast. Um, that will let you know ahead of time of what opportunities are coming. And we always have opportunities coming up. So um, that will give you a, a little bit of a heads up and some time to prepare if there's something that you see you want to apply to. Also, our um, higher ed awards, uh, the, especially the Helix Award, we, we just recently added a new modality to it where um, you as higher ed institutions can count towards the 50% of new and underutilized um, subpartners. Before that was re that was reserved just for um, higher ed uh, institutions that were overseas, not not United States. So uh, Tuskegee already won two sub awards um, through that, and. Um, we are, you know, kind of on a rolling basis. They're doing like different addenda um, to that um, mechanism, which will be available. It got extended to 2025. So you want to keep an eye on um, those awards and see when they pop up. And um, that would also have to be advertised on our grant stack of and um, the business forecast. You can also go to the, the Helix um, website. And then we have the incubator awards that, um, that um, sorry, the counselor just men mentioned earlier in his speech. And that's something that we just started uh, this past year and had four awards go out to minority serving institutions to get specific tailored assistance on how to work with us. And it's very tailored to each university and what they are looking for. So I encourage, you all to keep an eye out for that as that we may, we are hoping is, this is dependent right now on funding and um, making, and this mechanism being extended. But if it is, we will be hopefully offering another four, at least four, maybe four to six um, awards through that program where you can get your specific tailored um, assistance. And uh, we have also had the laser which was also mentioned by uh, the counselor, the Laser Pulse um, uh, partner, which does uh, research. They put out an MSI request for application and they are do they're gonna be doing their awards soon. 
that is closed right now, but that's something to keep an eye on. And I would um, encourage people to visit the Laser Pulse website. I can drop that in the link and um, sign up for um, their, um, their membership if you, if you have not already. And um, so that's, that's what I have to offer right now. Basically, go to sign up for business forecast, keep an eye out. We continually are encouraging um, people throughout USAID to use what, um, what RT just mentioned, the mechanism for restricting eligibility to MSIs. And so we, we hope to keep improving that and offering more um, opportunities. Thanks. Thank you, Dana. Um, I will go ahead and segue to the next question. So the next question is submitted by, looks like Dr. Montos. And, and I think there's some other, I think there's some similar comments here by other uh, faculty members. Uh, so small universities, University of Puerto Rico is used as an example here, that our HSI have problems competing with larger universities to get funding. How can this be improved? Um, so I'm going to direct this question starting off to you, Dana, and then I'll go ahead and give it over to Mary Beth and uh, Saul. Great, thanks, RT. Um, again, I would suggest first off to go through our training modules that we have um, that are available on the workwithusaid.org. Um, website. These are very detailed training manuals um, that can provide a lot of information. Uh, also, you know, feel free to reach out to me and our office, and we are, um, we have different things available. For instance, we have like a speaker series where we can come to your school and um, either virtually or in person and um, discuss, you know, how um, talk to the students, talk to the faculty about our work uh, or different, uh, you know, in whatever technical field that you wish, which kind of helps start building a relationship with us and you start learning like how we're working and we learn how you all work and it kind of builds that relationship. We are definitely um, interested in building our relationship in Puerto Rico. And um, this is, you know, we specifically have discussed this already. So um, as well as Hawaii and Alaska. So, um, you know, we hope to um, expand our partnerships there and look forward to working with you. Also, please consider, you know, trying to be a sub partner. That is a way to start many, many partners, not just MSI, start as sub partners to, um, to our larger implementing partner um, partners that have been running you know, programs for a long time. And that's how they kind of get their foot in the door and learn how we work. I'm gonna segue over to uh, Mary Beth to see if you have anything you wanna to add to this comment. Sure, um, so one thing I would say is, and I don't know if USAID does this already, but it would be advantageous to think about um, splitting things up into institutions by size and maybe even um, look at resources in terms of the opportunities that are available. There are lots of other organizations that do that, and sometimes that can be really advantageous. Um, another thing could be to set up, um, and again, I'm not sure if, if this is already being done, but to set up uh, partners for institutions that are just starting to do this type of work, and those partners can be um, can serve as a guide and a source of technical expertise. Um, that's another strategy that tends to work really well. I also lastly would say that I do think it's a really good idea for any organization that is working with minority serving institutions or, you know, under-resourced institutions um, in particular that uh, financially resourced. MSIs have tons of uh, human resources, but um, but it's incredibly important to rethink the way that you do things uh, and try to think about it from the perspective of the person going through the process. Um, sometimes you can take like a, a page from the design thinking notebook where designers always 
try to think about the participant or the consumer or the customer and how they walk through an experience or experience a product. I think that's a really good idea when it comes to especially smaller institutions uh, that don't have the bandwidth to apply for some opportunities. And I will go ahead and segue the last part of this question over to Dr. Sandoval. It, uh, internally, the university is responsible for building a team of professionals who are able to navigate the very complex protocols that grants imply. So that means that the institution itself needs to be very much aware of what type of team they need and what type of competencies this, this team needs uh, in order to apply and then successfully go through uh, the, um, the, the, the application process. That's, that's, that's one part. The other part is that ex, 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 you know, internally and then now externally, right? Externally, um, agencies need to understand that there's a lot of potential, a lot of untapped talent that's out there that they need to go into and then they need to uh, uh, leverage in a very strong way. So bringing these two together and then having trainings or having workshops on how to appropriately navigate this very close circle, this very close society um, of the grant uh, uh, application process, I think it's very important. And I think will provide and yield a much higher number of uh, diverse um, and pretty you know, robust uh, number of institutions that will provide uh, a new insight on our future of food security. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sandoval. So we have about one minute left. And what I want to do is go ahead in this. Uh, I like the fact that you do not have to wait until July 12th, uh, but we do encourage you to submit any feedback to us um, by before July 12th um, so we can go through and kind of look at the stuff over the closing months. Um, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and uh, segue this back over. I want to thank everyone and all the participants for you know all your thoughtful comments and questions and the, the panelists for your responses. We appreciate all your input. Again, uh, I ask you to please, please, I encourage you to submit that feedback by Wednesday, July 12th, uh, so we can uh, sift through those, those comments and also uh, go to uh, usaid.gov slash BIFAD. Uh, the link will be provided in the chat to share the TOR. Thank you. RT, thank you for uh, facilitating uh, such a great discussion and collection of useful questions and comments. Um, this has been such a stimulating and rich discussion today. Uh, as we close out today's session, I wanna highlight some of the most resonant themes uh, that our speakers touched on today. In our first panel, uh, discussion, we heard from Mary Beth Gassman, uh, Venu Kal Kalavacharya, and Monty Randall. Mary Beth talked about the distinguishing richness of MSI culture, from their curriculum to their service orientation within local and regional communities. She shared her experience with both the barriers that impede federal partnerships and the characteristics of the most successful ones, including regular communication, equity and learning flows from MSI to agency and from agency to MSI, and clarity in partnership definition or cutting through the jargon with adequate resources to support a partnership's constituent components. Cal shared NIFA's experience and targeted and sustained outreach to MSIs that eliminated the gap in funding success rates between MSIs and non-MSIs over just a couple of years. He also pointed to other levels of collaborative opportunities, including the encouragement of MSI faculty to participate in the panel process and in mock panel presentations at meetings and symposia. Monty drew our attention to the foundation of Muskogee cultural values in driving successful and mutually beneficial partnerships. He also observed that more explicit consideration of cultural assessments in proposal evaluation would better highlight the unique qualifications of tribal colleges in partnering with indigenous communities around the world 
for productive collaborations that strengthen both U.S. and partner country communities and their relationships with government agencies. Levon shared an overview of the role of MSIs in the Feed the Future Innovation Labs and identified the need for more significant, more rapid progress. One avenue to accelerate this work is through intentional capacity building efforts for MSIs to develop more competitive funding proposals. Levon then led a conversation with Saul Jimenez Sandoval and Kia Jones. Saul, Saul discussed Fresno State's deep technical expertise and its intersectional community-focused agricultural work, drawing in faculty from engineering, science, mathematics, and business to tackle complex problems from salinity to supply chains and generate scalable solutions. He highlighted the capacity of MSIs to work effectively with diverse and resource-constrained partners, both domestically and internationally. He spoke candidly about some of the structural barriers which impede federal partnerships through burdensome reporting requirements and less familiarity with international implementation protocols, and also about some of the solutions put into place on the MSI side that better leverage successful experiences for institutional learning. Finally, Kia brought in the perspective of earlier career researchers around whom these efforts are centered. She shared that policy-focused students in the agricultural space don't always easily see the connections between domestic and international systems and the lessons that can be learned in both directions across these research communities. Like Mary Beth, at the beginning of today's conversation, Kia emphasized MSI commitment to service and recommended that a service orientation be an explicit consideration for subcommittee membership. She also recommended a balance between hard and social science perspectives and the complementary value of industry perspectives. A point that I found particularly resonant was that there will inevitably be some important perspectives missing from a small subcommittee. And BIFAD should formally recognize unrepresented viewpoints and work to incorporate them through subsequent work. I would also like to thank our audience for the many insightful co contributions you shared today. You may continue to submit written comments and relevant materials to BIFAD's consideration over the next two weeks until July 12th by using the feedback form on our website or by sending an email. We'll put instructions in the chat. A recording of today's meeting and its minutes will be posted on the USA website. Many people contributed to the success of today's event. And I'd like to thank our moderators, Henri, Lavon, and RT for their leadership and our speakers and panelists, Councillor White, Dina Esposito, Mary Beth, Monty, Cal, Saul, Kia, for their remarks and insights. I'd like to thank the BIFAD support team, Reed Hamill, Rachel Helbig, Carmen Benson, Tommy Crocker, and Alice McKenzie for their support, and also BIFAD's Executive Director, Clara Cohen at USAID. We'll be circulating a post-meeting survey in the chat and later via a newsletter. Please take a moment to fill it out and let us know how we're doing. Thank you again for joining us for this interesting and important conversation at this BIFAD public meeting. Take care, everyone. We are adjourned.